Hello and welcome to the IEA channel. Today I'm joined by Dr Stephen Davies, Head of Education at the Institute of Economic Affairs. A couple of years ago, uh, the IEA produced a podcast series with Steve called What You Didn't Learn in History Class. In this series, Steve argued that the way history is taught is flawed. For one, we put too much emphasis on politics and power rather than trade, innovation and entrepreneurship. While it may be too early to draw conclusions on how the current pandemic will be remembered, portrayed and indeed judged in years to come, Steve has identified four key narratives in which the pandemic is already being understood that may well shape the way this moment is remembered in the future. If you enjoy this video, please do leave a comment and uh, give it a thumbs up. Hi, Steve. Thanks for joining me. Hi there. Um, so you've said previously that history has been taught very badly. Mm -hmm. I tend to agree. Certainly the secondary school uh, curriculum, in my view, lacks a focus on chronology, which I think would be useful. But you've argued that we focus too much retention on the specific historical dates, big political moments, meaning that we can overlook moments that have arguably shaped history more. What yeah. examples of this are there? Well, uh, it, the favourite example for me is the invention of the container ship um, in the 1950s by Malcolm McLean, which completely transformed world trade. It reduced the cost of shipping goods around the world by a factor of 30. So moving goods around the world came to cost one thirtieth of what it cost before then. And the kind of world we live in now with lots and lots of global economic integration, you're going into uh, clothes stores and buying garments made in Bangladesh, that kind of thing, that's all made possible by the container ship. So that's an example of the kind of thing that I think is commonly missed. Uh, it's worth saying that also events like um, major pandemics are, you know, often missed as well. So uh, it's only recently that people have remembered or realised that we had a major pandemic in 1968-69 and another one in 1957-58, uh, two big flu pandemics. Uh, even the great flu pandemic of 1918-19, to 19, which has obviously had a lot of attention now, again, that's not remembered in the same way that the Great War, which had just finished then, is remembered. So it's not just economic things that tend to be overlooked, it's also things like uh, major medical events, if you will, uh, things that don't fit into the standard political story. So why do you think that is? You said it's, they don't fit into the political story. Is it just that as human beings, we're more fascinated with how politicians and big key figures have behaved and what they've done? What do you think it's down to? I actually think it's down to the way in which um, history as a subject and other ac academic disciplines are taught, i.e. through state-funded education systems, because uh, I think human beings are equally fascinated by the lives and careers of the rich and famous, major business mm -hmm. figures, major cultural or intellectual figures. They're fascinated by the life of ordinary people and the way it's impacted by things like epidemics. I think it's just that most history and most other subjects are taught through a state education system. And therefore, not surprisingly, uh, the syllabus tends to focus upon the history and development of the state, of the country, the nation state particularly. And so there's a big focus on wars, politicians, what politicians get up to, uh, much less focus upon other things like social change, uh, economic change and cultural and intellectual development. It'd be quite interesting to get your thoughts on the current campaign. Well, I think it's been going on for a few years, the campaign to decolonize the curriculum. The central idea, which sort of fits into what you're saying, I guess, behind the campaign is that they believe that we learn about colonialism purely through the victor's point of view. Yeah. Do you think that that is understandable and is something that perhaps should be looked at? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's that's very true, actually. The, um, the way in which colonialism is taught, to the extent that it's taught at all, actually, um, is still very much done through the prism of, you know, Britain being the imperial power, going out there, conquering these various parts of the world. And it's also true to say that's true even of the critical um, accounts where the British are portrayed in a very dark light, quite justified in some cases, uh, it's still the British who are the active party, if you will. Uh, and the people out in Africa, South Asia, India, of course, and other places, they're the people who are acted upon by the British. And that misunderstands the nature, I think, of the imperial experience. Uh, and I think, yes, there is a good need for 
changing the curriculum. Um, Paul Gilroy, a uh, well-known um, scholar, he had a really interesting book quite recently about the the Atlantic and the way in which the slave trade and all the other imperial relations across the Atlantic in the 18th and 19th century uh, affected both the people like the Africans who were taken to the New World as slaves, but also the people who took them there. Uh, and similarly with Britain and India, uh, there's all sorts of stuff about the impact that the British had upon India, but it worked the other way as well. Uh, the experience of being in India, coming into contact with Indian civilization, had a huge effect on British society uh, in all kinds of ways that are not really explored. Like it transformed British government, for example. The India office was our first modern department of state. And all of the subsequent offices that were created in the reform of British government in the 20th century were basically built on the template of the India office. So the experience of imperial government there transformed British government and internally. And that's the kind of thing that's completely overlooked. Yeah, that's very interesting. I guess in schools there's obviously time restrictions, but I think you're right that it could be used as a positive change whereby we understand more about well, our own national history yeah, through the sure. eyes of other other perspectives. I guess this also feeds into the idea that you put forward in a in a in another uh, video, which was about the statue debate. Yeah. You argued, <laughs> which was a fun one. Um, you argued that there is well, there isn't one collective national memory, and that therefore, well, celebrating or commemorating certain historical figures in the public realm isn't probably the best way of going about things. Mm -hmm. I thought that, that that was a very interesting yeah. um, point that you made. Yes, that, that's exactly, you've summarised it very precisely. The When you have public commemorations of figures, statues in large public places, which are erected very often with public money, the idea is that there's a shared commemoration, which is clearly untrue. You know, all sorts of people are very controversial. Uh, even Winston Churchill, I don't think there'd be much support for putting up a statue of him in South Wales, for example. And so the, the idea is that there's a kind of shared common memory that everyone has, and also that that memory has a common evaluation of past events and past individuals. That's simply not true. And when you get public memorialization, you're actually engaged in an enterprise of trying to create or sustain such a memory. Now, some people, like my interlocutor in that video you referred to, Alex Dean, they think that, yes, that is what you're doing, and a good thing too. Alex's view is that we ought to create such an artificial shared memory. Uh, my view is that no, that's uh, you know an illegitimate enterprise. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, and that what actually you should do is have private memorials that people should, people for example who are fans of the British Empire and want to promote a particular narrative of the history of the British Empire should have their own kind of theme park where you would have lots of statues, people like Henry Havelock and Charles Napier and people like that, and you could go and you know get imbibe that particular narrative. There might be a, a weak or liberal. You know, historical memorial where you could go and look at statues of people like Gladstone and Lloyd George and others and, uh, in, you know, imbibe the story of liberal reform and Whig history. These are all different accounts of the past uh, and they're not really compatible ultimately because they involve different normative judgments. And to believe that there's a single narrative story that everyone in the country buys into is, is simply completely false. And I think the attempt to create such a narrative is wrong. You make a rather radical viewpoint seem eminently reasonable, Steve. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting point of view. So if we move on to the current pandemic and how yeah. that will be remembered, you've identified four narratives in which the pandemic is already being, I guess, framed. What are yeah. those? Well, before I actually run through it, it's worth saying one thing. Um, it's an interesting comparison with the great uh, Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1919. One of the features of that pandemic is that it was there was no kind of public memory of it. You don't find it as a major kind of event in the histories of the 20th century. It's typically seen as a kind of appendage or attachment to the war. And the memory, uh, the memory of that pandemic and all the people it killed in Britain and elsewhere is largely in the domain of the private. It's a kind of familial thing that people will remember that, you know, one of their relatives died from the flu uh, after the war, very often having survived the war tragically because it killed young people more than anything else, that flu. Uh, and so what you don't have until perhaps very, very recently is a sort of public historical, large scale historical narrative in which the Spanish flu plays a major part. Now, 
I think COVID is different because of things like the lockdowns, because there has been such an active role played by government in trying to control the event. It's gone into the realm of the public. And so I think we are seeing the development of already of historical stories in which people are trying to make sense of what's going on and make it a part of a longer story. And what is interesting is that the narratives you can already see are ones in which COVID and the pandemic is, if you like, a kind of punctuation mark. I think all of the stories were already starting to get told are ones in which this pandemic marks a kind of inflection or turning point in history. Uh, and not that it necessarily causes it, but it's the kind of punctuation mark, the point at which one sentence, if you like, ends and another one starts. One story comes to a conclusion and another story gets underway. And so I think it's being used, if you will, as a kind of key event in uh, stories about what has happened in the last 30, 40 years, maybe even a longer period, and what might be happening in the future. And I think um, there's four of these, as you say. One is that we're coming to the end of globalization. Uh, a lot of the narratives at the moment are that we've lived through an era, maybe 50, 60 years, of increasing closeness, increasing globalization, uh, the construction of an international order based upon rules and ultimately underwritten by the power of the United States. And a common kind of understanding of the pandemic is that it marks the end of that uh, period of globalization, that we're coming to the end of an era of closer trade connections between the world, but also an era in which there was a kind of understanding that all the world was going in broadly the same direction and was going to end up ultimately being something like California. So John Gray and the New Statesman, for example, he's located the um, pandemic very much in that sort of narrative. This is the end of a global liberal project, if you will. So that's one narrative. Another one is that what we're seeing is the end of neoliberalism. So quite a lot of people have argued that what we've had since the 1980s, maybe even the 1970s, is an era of neoliberalism, meaning a move towards a particular kind of market-driven public policy, and that the uh, this is being brought to a complete final end by the uh, pandemic. The argument is typically that it was already on the rocks because of the financial crisis in 2008, and that what the pandemic has done is conclusively end that. So the argument is really that we're seeing the end of neoliberalism. Now, to be fair, the people who put this argument forward are not at all clear about what is coming afterwards, uh, because there are several competing. There are lots of people who are prepared to dance on the grave of neoliberalism, uh, mm -hmm. but they have very different ideas about what should or is going to come afterwards. And then finally, you have the kind of truly catastrophic vision that what we're seeing is an early sign of the end of civilization. And this is a view which is popular with radical environmentalists who think that basically what we've had for about 200 years now is an increasingly dysfunctional uh, industrial civilization and that we finally hit the buffers really and that a big pandemic is a kind of example of that. So there's an American commentator called Umar Haq uh, who recently had a column just a couple of days ago saying that, you know, why do you feel gloomy? Well, it's because our whole civilization is falling to pieces, baby. This is like, you know, <laughs> where we're going. Uh, really is Mr. Cheerful, Lomar. Uh, <laughs> there's a kind of narrative which says that what we're maybe seeing is a transformation of social life, that we've gotten used to living in a particular way, uh, and that this has finally come to an end and that we're going to live in a different way uh, going forward. So that's kind of social history account in which the argument is that what we're seeing here is an inflection between one pattern or type of daily life and a movement into another one. Hmm. To what extent do you think that these are, I guess, people with a certain political or worldview, putting their own view onto, yeah. onto what's happening here? Yeah, projecting it, yes. Projecting, yes. Absolutely. yes. Yeah, and that's what always happens with history. Um, the people who write accounts of the past, if they're professional historians, they always try to detach themselves as much as possible from their actual location in time and space. Um, 
you know, the idea is not the great sin if you're a historian is presentism, which is interpreting the past not on its own account, but in terms of the present or standpoint of the historian. You should try to avoid that. But it's impossible to avoid doing it. You can't, nobody can completely detach themselves from where they are, the perspective they bring to the world, their underlying normative beliefs and the like. You can't write a subject, you know, an account of the past as these phrase has it, some specky AI turn it artist from the standpoint of eternity. And of course, lots of people who are writing the kind of narratives I'm talking about here are not professional historians. They're, you know, people, <clears throat> perfectly good intellectuals, but people with a different kind of agenda or interest. And so not surprisingly, they see the world in a particular way. They see the world before the pandemic in a particular way. And that then leads them to fit the pandemic and its impact into that previous narrative and it's a case of projecting both hopes and fears if you will onto the current situation and what you think it's going to work out as in the next few years. Yes you've highlighted that there is a, a an apocalyptic tone to yeah. these to these narratives why do you think that is is that something we've always done as human beings or is it sort of accelerated uh, yes, there is. I mean, quite a few of these, maybe not the last one, but the other three definitely have an apocalyptic quality, particularly the third one. Um, it's not a human being thing. It's very much a monotheistic thing. The, the idea of the apocalypse is the idea that history is, has a kind of unidirectional arc. It starts at a particular point and then it works through time to an end state, which is what the apocalypse is. And the apocalypse is the kind of point where everything that is falls apart, and as a result, the ultimate purpose or point of history is revealed. Uh, that's what the word actually means. It means an unfailing. Now, that's very much a Christian and Muslim idea, uh, not as so much Jewish, although Jews have it as well. It comes from the monotheistic religions, in other words. And one of the reasons why so many people in our culture, if you like, tend to turn to apocalyptic narratives is because our um, way of thinking is still framed by Christian categories. Uh, in this case, a way of thinking about history that you can trace all the way back to St. Augustine in the 5th century, in which history is always working up to a kind of final denouement, a big apocalypse. Uh, and it's always flattering to think that you're living in the last generation. Uh, so everyone wants to think that their generation is the one when the whole point of history is going to be revealed. So that's why we're so receptive to apocalyptic accounts. Uh, now, traditional Indian and Chinese civilization, or for that matter, Greco-Roman, classical Roman civilization, they have a very different view of history, a more cyclical view. And so they don't tend to, uh, you know, view history in quite the same way. Uh, and there's a tendency to think that, yes, this is something that's going on, but it's very much like things that have happened repeatedly in the past, because history is understood as having a kind of recurrent cyclical quality to it, rather than having a unidirectional arc. So that's why I think we have, a, a Europeans, people from a Christian background or a Muslim background, have a particular propensity to think in this way. And looking to the sort of globalist narrative, are you sympathetic with that? I know we've seen a sort of stark decrease in the amount of, um, well, movement of goods. And we've also seen an acceleration in protectionist trends, perhaps. But we've also seen in the last couple of months that trade has gone back up again to a, to a large extent. Do you think that's totally overblown? Um, I think it may well be overblown. The jury is still out on this, really. And this ultimately comes down to how politics works out rather than economics. Um, I think that this is a classic example of a case where people project both hopes and fears onto uh, how they view the present moment. So there are some people who dislike globalization, think that it's the worst thing ever, and that they are hoping that this is the end of it. And so they're projecting their hope. There are other people like myself who actually think globalization is a wonderful thing and therefore fear the, that it's coming to an end. Uh, and I think that if you just left the world purely to the workings of economics, trade and exchange, it would not be coming to an end. There's a kind of natural logic to increasing economic integration and globalization. But of course, the point is there are other forces in the world politics above all which don't necessarily work that way and so the question really is whether or not uh, the global rules-based order that I most spoke about a moment ago that was created bit by bit after World War II leading up to the 1990s whether that will survive or whether we are indeed entering into an era uh, where there's going to be intensified great power competition and 
the breakdown of a lot of that international rules based order because if that happens then uh, that will also then have a knock-on effect upon economic globalization because in the absence of a system of agreed rules uh, we might well see a return to protectionism so I think the jury is still out on that I think actually it is too early to say whether the, the virus and the way it's affected the world economy is going to be seen as a kind of end of globalization or not I hope not uh, but on the other hand, it could be, but it depends ultimately on how the politics works out. Yes, it will be fascinating to see how this uh, is portrayed in in history books to come. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for joining me. That was a fascinating discussion. Thank you.